The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, whose star this is, is very clever. His house is in the warts, however. He will not see us stopping here to make our carbon-based endeavor. But we've miles to go before we sleep. Miles to go before we sleep. Lois McMaster Boo Joel, and part one of the miniseries adaptation of Eric Flint's Islands, plus part 25 of our complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Hard Magic. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain editor Tony Daniel. Wow, we have a good one for you this time. We have part one of a two-part interview with Lois McMaster Bujold. She discusses her Vorkosigan saga novel Memory, which has been reissued this month in a nice new trade paperback format. We'll discuss the creation of Memory with Lois and many other things, Miles and Vorkosigan. We also continue with our complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Hard Magic as read by Bronson Pinchot. And starting with this podcast, Bain Books Audio Drama presents the first installment of a four-part audio drama miniseries, Eric Flint's Islands, set in the world of the Belisaria series by Eric Flint and David Drake. This is an entirely original adaptation. It's a show, not an audiobook. We have a full cast of professional actors, an all-original musical soundtrack, and cinema-quality sound effects. The adaptation is written in four acts, and the entire production runs about an hour and a half. So we will present Act 1 of Islands this time on the podcast. Act 2 will debut next Friday. Act 3 the following week. And the finale will appear on October 9th. We invite you to open up your imagination and let this most excellent audio drama transport you to the last days of the Roman Empire. But this is a Roman Empire that has been radically changed by the introduction of technology from the future. Islands has all that plus war, sword fights, ironclad steamships, and an epic love story. So that will be coming right up after the interview with Lois Bujold. But before we get to the good stuff, here's a bit of news. The September Earks have been released into the wild. Now, an Eark is the prehistoric ancestor of the California condor, known for snatching up hunter-gatherers wholesale and dropping them from great heights, sometimes to obtain food, but mostly just for the heck of it. In fact, it's speculated that the Eark may have been responsible for the disappearance of the Neanderthals. Earks were said to have liked lowbrow cuisine. No, no, no. An eARC is actually an electronic advanced reading copy of a book. These are the unproofread earliest version of an author's work. We put these out in ebook form usually at least three months prior to the book's first appearance in print. The September eARCs include Paradigms Lost by Reiki Spore. This is Reich's complete rewrite of his vampire contemporary fantasy novel Digital Night. It's really fun urban fantasy with a really cool take on vampires. Also out is Collision, book four of The Secret World Chronicle by Mercedes Lackey and Friends. Superheroes, they call them metaheroes in the books, face down a menace from beyond and enemies at home. This is book four in the series, and it all began as a shared experience playing the MMO game City of Heroes, Misty Lackey and and her co-authors, and the characters are taken from there. Next is Undercity by Catherine Acero. I was the editor on this, and I'm excited about it. Catherine takes us back to her far-future Scolian Empire, but this time we see it from the perspective of a very able private investigator searching through the underworld for a kidnapped princeling. It's good, gritty, fun stuff. Also, we have 1636, The Viennese Waltz by Eric Flint, Paula Goodlett, and Gorge Huff. This is the same team that brought you 1635, the Kremlin Games, one of my favorites in the Ring of Fire series, and now they're back with this one set in 1630s Vienna. 
but this is of course a vienna changed by the appearance of the west virginia town of grantville in the midst of seventeenth century europe and we have sort of michael the first entry in a really interesting new urban fantasy series by marcus wen this one has an armed and dangerous shaman warrior as a hero these are all available now at baneybooks.com go ye there and check them out here is part one of a two-part interview with Lois McMaster Bujold discussing her novel, Memory. I want to welcome Lois McMaster Bujold once again to the podcast. Hi, Lois. Hi, Tony. Glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Lois McMaster Bujold is the creator of one major science fiction series and two major fantasy series. Her Vorkosigan saga, featuring for the most part the adventures and misadventures of Noble Sion or Sion and Troublemaker of Interstellar Empire, for many years disabled, brittle boned, extremely short, Miles Vorkosigan, as well as many other characters who share the Vorkosiverse. Lois has won five Hugos, three Nebulas, and a bunch of other awards. The Vorkosigan saga has produced multiple New York Times bestsellers, yay, including. The latest entry in the series, which is Captain Vorpatrel's Alliance, which is not a Miles book, but the long-awaited Ivan book. Yet, today, on sale now at booksellers everywhere, is the reissue of Lois's Vorkosigan novel Memory in a lovely trade paperback format. It's book nine in the series, I think, and in it we find Miles turning 30 years of age. Lois, did I get all that right? And... Uh... <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. The, uh, I never actually named the series myself. Vorkosiverse is what the fans started dubbing it, so it's, it's a name that it acquired. Uh, but, uh, yeah, <laughs> had I known back in 1982 when I started this thing how long it was going to last, I would have given my characters much shorter names <laughs> and easier to pronounce. But here we are. People learn. Well, one of the reasons we wanted to reissue this particular book is that this one is Bain publisher Tony Weisskopf's favorite Vorkosigan uh, novel, and that seems to be true of many of the, the longtime readers of the Miles books. Um, I think it's a great book. It's one of the milestones, as it were, <laughs> of the series. What, yeah. do you, what do you think about it? Any favoritism among your books? Is this one, or, or is it an ugly stepchild? <laughs> and why do you think this particular book has been so powerful for others? Yeah, this is an interesting book. It's a book that sort of stands on all the books that have gone before it in the series. It's kind of simultaneously a sequel to all of them. It's a big turning point for the series, and the character makes some major life changes. Uh, and I think a lot of people who have you know, gone through life changes or are facing them uh, are hitting 30, and 30, yeah, the, the, uh, the description, short description of the book was Miles Hits 30, 30 Hits Back. <laughs> and uh, anyone who's going through that experience uh, finds a lot to uh, a lot to resonate you know, in their own lives. So, I, so I think there's a good bit of that. Miles makes some pretty appalling mistakes uh, in the beginning of the book, and they are uh, are the kind of thing that you can you can identify with. You can see it coming. You could. I've had readers tell me I've read it six times and I still shot at the page. No, 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 Miles, don't do that. Um, so, uh, so it. Uh, it seems to be very emotionally, um, it connects with people uh, in their own lives, even though yeah. it takes place in this gaudy space opera setting. Have you gotten fan mail on this book a lot? Uh, I get fan mail on all of them. Uh, I get, uh, back when I was, you know, before the internet, I would get maybe half a dozen uh, paper letters a, a year. You know, there would be a little spurt of them right after a new book came out, and then they would trail off. But now that I'm on the internet, I get fan email from all over the world uh, several times a week, and that's fun and interesting and much easier to answer because you know, there's a return reply. Uh, so I get uh, all of the books seem to have people for whom they are their favorites. Uh, but yeah, memory is is one for people who've been through the mill, I think. Mm. So what about you? Do you have any favorites? Mm, it's always hard to say. Uh, memory's right up near the top. Uh, Mirror Dance is pretty strong. Uh, a Civil Campaign, of course, that one's very popular. I like that one, too. The, the, the favorites kind of cluster around certain titles. Uh, 
probably those those three are big ones. Well, that's the that is the predecessor to this one and the the follow up to this one, isn't it? Mirror Dance is about Miles. Clone. Yeah, Mirror Dance comes comes before Memory, and uh, immediately following Memory is Kamar in the timeline, if uh, I yeah. recall. That may even that wasn't quite the order they were written in. I wrote Mirror Dance in 1992. That was published in '94, um, and I had actually had some of the ideas for memory before I wrote Mirror Dance. I had about four pages of outline of uh, of a much different book, uh, but also environment involving uh, Simon Mill Alien's memory chip breaking down. Um, and I set it aside because I really needed to know what was going on with Mark uh, before I embarked on this this other book that I had the notion for. And that led to Mirror Dance, and Mirror Dance led to all kinds of things that I wasn't expecting. It was a very, it was a book that uh, surprised me in many ways. Mark is uh, Miles' then, clone. Uh, Mark is Miles' clone brother who pops up. Uh, he had popped up originally in Brothers in Arms. These books have irregular linkages, you know, so that they, they're really a net of books rather than a line of books. Uh, although they do have a, a serious chronological order and uh, sort of recommended you read them that way. But they do all stand alone. I have to keep reassuring readers, yeah, if you pick this one on the, off the shelf, it's okay, it's safe to read it. You'll still get a complete book. But, uh, yeah, so it's a sequencing books here. So we had, uh, had Mirror Dance, and that made a huge difference in my characters' lives. I think uh, between Mirror Dance and Memory, I had a drop-back book. I wrote Sita Ganda, which was a prequel. Uh, uh, jump back to when Miles was 10 years younger, and uh, he and his cousin Ivan Vorpatrol were sent as uh, envoys to a uh, state funeral uh, and had assorted misadventures there. And that was a lighter book, and I think I needed that breather uh, before I tackled Memory, which had weightier issues. Well, um, there's so much, Rich. I, I, I'm tempted to dive into uh, the the world of Cedaganda, but we better skip that for now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I, I love all these books cross connect. Yeah, yeah. You pull on the web and you get you know, buried in 15 volumes, but so, not all at once. You can take them one at a time. Yeah. Well, you can certainly me read Memory as a, Memory. as a standalone. Yeah. Um, so we find Miles. He's come back from death, basically uh, cryo suspension. And he's been hiding a hidden ailment. Uh, and Miles usually is pretty exacting toward his duties uh, in MSEC and the Bar Bar and military. Um, why does he have this near career ending lapse of judgment? And, and probably we can say what it is. There's... Yeah, at this point. Uh, he came out of uh, Mirror Dance with a seizure disorder. And it didn't go away. He thought it was going to. He kept thinking he was getting better, and then he'd get another one, and it was like, oh, no, you know, do something else. Um, he had spent uh, the prior 10 years and several books uh, working up a separate covert ops identity as Admiral Miles Naismith of the Dairy Free Mercenary Fleet. Um, and he had invested a huge amount of his uh, his soul into this, this created persona, uh, it had really kind of cannibalized the rest of his life. It's, he really wanted to be Admiral Naismith. Admiral Naismith allowed him to do all kinds of things he couldn't do as, as Lord Miles Vorkosigan. And for a long period of time, it was a growth for, opportunity for him. Uh, you know, it was something he grew into. It allowed him to grow in ways that he couldn't grow back in his much more constrained home world. Uh, but uh, you know, he kind of got to the point where he had learned everything he could learn from it. But he'd become addicted uh, to the personality uh, because it was so much more rewarding. And uh, so when the seizure disorder came up that would, like, bounce him out of field work as, a, as an IMPSEC operative, uh, he concealed it. And then it uh, came out and bit him. Uh, we had the opening scene where he has just discovered that he has done something very, very bad <laughs> while he was having a seizure. Uh, and he tries to cover it up because he doesn't want to give up Miles Naismith. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, you know, that's really, he's trying to, trying to survive in, in this double identity because he doesn't think he can go back to just being Lord Varkosigan because the Lord Varkosigan he remembers is the Lord Varkosigan who's teen years and, you know, much more constrained, uh, smaller, earlier life. Uh, so he, 
he doesn't want to go back and he doesn't see how he can go on for a while there. Well, he says at some point uh, early on that if if uh, he had discovered somebody that made the lapse in judgment that he did, he would come down on them like a ton of bricks. Oh, yeah. You know, he had he had no... His brain was, like, divided in half. It was so far up the river denial, <laughs> he couldn't get back down. Um, and he really um, he knew better. Mm-hmm. There was no excuse for this. Uh, but he was pretty desperate. So he comes sort of back... fighting for his life, he felt. Yeah, yeah and fighting for... And he's, he's basically living two, two lives, one as, a, as an operative for the Empire and the other as this, this mercenary commander. Mm-hmm. Washbuckling and having fun. So, so yeah, yeah. So that was that was where all the fun. Was. I had an interesting conversation with Jim Bain way back when, when I was writing Mountains of Morning, I think it was. Uh, and it was very early in the series, and the question is, what whether it should be called the Miles Varkusigan series or the Miles Naismith series. <laughs> and Jim was pumping for the Miles Naismith series because he he like Miles thought that was where the action was. And I sort of wrote the Mountains of Mourning to, as a de- declaration that, no, actually, Miles is, is going to be anchored on barrier, and uh, this really needs to be the Miles Varkosigan series. Uh, even, you know, even though I hadn't envisioned any of these later books yet. Uh, so that was, that was an early early thing, and it was probably part of the seeds of, of memory, you know, thinking about this, these issues of you know, running two identities and which one's the real you and what happens when you get mixed up. And uh, where does your growth lie? Uh, so, uh, so all of that kind of uh, personal stuff uh, sort of went into the pot and bubbled for a long time, and then came out as this book. Well, it's not just uh, Miles who's having having personality issues. Um, mm-hmm. When Miles returns, he discovers that his boss, uh, director of Imsec, uh, Impsec. That's I M P S E C, by the way. Uh, Stands for Imperial Security for yeah. those who came in late. Right. So the way it manifests the, his boss's problem reminds me of some of my relatives who have Alzheimer's. Uh, did you draw on something like that when you were writing memory? Yeah. Uh, yes. As a matter of fact, this goes back once again. Every time you start talking about one of these books, you start talking about others. Back in Shards of Honor uh, is where Simon Nillian first stepped on stage as an IMSEC agent sent to watch Errol Borkosigan in the uh, in the military campaign that was going on there, and then he became an ongoing character. And uh, one of his most salient features is he has an eidetic memory chip. He has a had a chip installed in his brain that allows him to have a photographic memory. This was in a semi-experimental. Uh, piece of technology done off-world very expensively, and for many people it didn't work, but he managed to make it work for him. Uh, so this has been his, his kind of superpower all along, as he could remember everything, which is a, a very mixed blessing, as it turns out. But, you know, the thing about technologies is they go wrong, uh, and I thought, you know, what would happen if his memory chip went wrong? And uh, my initial idea for the story was actually that uh, the his chip would break down and Miles would take him to the planet where it was originally installed and try to get a repair, but that was, you know, that was before I wrote Mirror Dance and had better ideas. But yeah, the uh, other thing that fed into it was uh, visiting my brother-in-law. His wife's mother had uh, Alzheimer's, and uh, she was very well taken care of by her daughter and lived a long time in this dreadful condition. And uh, visiting with her, staying with her in an afternoon while they went out and having these conversations. She couldn't track, but she was. you could still have an interesting conversation with her if you just went where she went, kind of fuddled it along and, and sort of did a stream of consciousness thing. Um, it, was, it was very fascinating and, of course, very unnerving. Mm-hmm. Most science fiction readers are, are very... Uh, very wedded to the idea of being smart. Uh, one of the classic books of science fiction uh, is Flowers for Algernon, mm-hmm. in which a uh, mentally retarded character is uh, made smart through a technology that then breaks down, and uh, then you follow him through his progression not only to high intelligence but back down again. And it really freaks science fiction readers. There's a reason it's a classic. Daniel Keyes is the author. Mm-hmm. Um, 
so there was a little of that in there. There was uh, there was my uh, my relatives and uh, those experiences, those real life experiences. I had also worked uh, back in my twenties as a drug administration technician at Ohio State University Hospitals, and part of the time worked on the neurology unit where I saw all kinds of patients with uh, different neurological issues, uh, memories and strokes, and uh, just you know all kinds of scary stuff. So all of that went into it. So there was a lot, a lot of life experience that was behind uh, behind this notion. When it when it finally got onto the page, it was pretty concentrated. Maybe I should skip forward and ask you a, another question I was planning to ask, which is, uh, what was going on in uh, in your life at the time you were writing this? Do you remember? Uh, I mean, we don't want to get too specific, but do you remember what <laughs> Simon's what... chip? <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Um, that would have been soon after my move to Minneapolis. Um, and I was just looking at, before this interview, I was looking at publication dates to kind of jog that memory. Um, well, memory came out in 1996, so you must have finished six, it yeah. by So I was writing it the year that I moved, uh, and also the year that uh, 1995 would have been the year that uh, Mirror Dance actually won the Hugo Award uh, in London. So I remember we had... We had the house move, and ten days later, the trip to London. <laughs> it was like very frantic for a while there, um, but it all worked out. And then, uh, then I settled down to sort of my new life in Minnesota and moved from Ohio. Uh, so that was a very busy year, and uh, you know, no wonder I needed a drop back book. Uh, so Seed Again was actually the first book I wrote in my you know, my new uh, digs in Minneapolis, and then uh, Memory followed because. It was ready at that point. Knew what I wanted to do, do with the ideas. Kids in school. Um, let's see. It would have been high school for my older child and junior high for my younger. And uh, yeah, so it was a busy life <laughs> at that yeah. time. Had you switched over to uh, word processors at that time? Yeah, I switched over. Fairly early on, I had uh, started off on my old college report typewriter with carbon copies you know, back in the early 80s because I had no money. And uh, in the mid-80s, I switched to a very early computer that had a Daisy Will printer. It was an old Coleco Atom with a tape drive I clooched along for for several years. And then I inherited my dad's K-Pro 2 for a couple of years. I did several books on that. And then I started the uh, the got the first uh, MS-DOS system in the mid-90s, but I wasn't on the net yet. I didn't get on the internet until after I moved to Minneapolis, so which would have been mid-90s, late-90s. What about the milieu of the book? Um, some people that will come to memory haven't uh, haven't jumped into the entire Vorkosiverse yet. Okay, yeah, let's, yeah, where did the Vorkosiverse come from? What is it? Yeah, it's a semi-generic space opera background. We have We're picking up the stories about a thousand years from now, putatively. Um, uh, There was an initial early effort at uh, sublight exploration and colonization of worlds that didn't come to much, although they did get one world, Beta Colony, uh, colonized during that period. And then uh, someone discovered the wormhole jump drive, uh, where you could find places in space that would take you, allow you to punch through instantaneously to elsewhere in space. So these are like uh, shortcuts. Um, and this uh, opened up uh, colonization to, you know, to the world. Uh, and so there was a diaspora from Earth of everybody going out trying to do assorted colonial experiments, uh, of which Barrier was a fairly early one. Uh, but the wormhole through which it was settled uh, collapsed uh, very shortly after the settlement started, so they became a lost colony for uh, about 600 years and regressed uh, to uh, a more or less feudal uh, culture and uh, technology level. They were just getting back up out of it, you know, heading heading to the 19th century, uh, just about to get get things pulled together uh, when they were rediscovered through another wormhole um, by the Nexus at large, which, of course, had been progressing for all this time. And then we had uh, about a hundred years of shakedown on that, and then we pick up uh, we pick up our story uh, about a generation or two into the rediscovery when uh, the barrier is undergoing all kinds of social 
stresses uh, due to all these changes in the future, you know, it's kind of dropping in on them um, uh, toxically in the form of the seed again an invasion, which had happened you know, quite early on, which they threw off that great effort. So it's a very traumatized, war-torn, interesting society that's trying to get better. Uh, and out of this, we come, come with our main characters who are uh, variously representative of, of different issues. So. That was part one of a two-part interview with Lois McMaster Bujold. We'll have part two and the finale next week on the podcast. Now here is part one of the four-part miniseries presentation of Islands. Enjoy and let us know what you think. Bain Audio Drama from Bain Books. The heart of science fiction and fantasy. Bain Audio Drama presents... Eric Flint's Islands, based on the novella by Eric Flint, set in the world of the Belisarius series by Eric Flint and David Drake. Mortada ko tu medalo, babachida mim hai. Incoming! Get down! Get down! Get behind the wall! You heard the captain. Behind the ramparts, you lazy dogs! Don't have to tell me twice, Sarge. Bowers are having us for lunch! The young captain will see us through. Run! Run, you dogs! Run for your lives! You get down too, sir! I will look! I... Ah! Sir, are you alright? Captain Serenites! Sir! It hurts! Sir, are you hit? That was close, sir. If you hadn't have given the order, that mortar would have cut us all to pieces. Sir? Sir, let me turn you over. Ah! Is it... what happened? Holy Am I? Mary, mother of God! Is it? It can't be night already, can it? Saints protect us. What is it, Luke? What are you talking about? Oh, sir. Speak, man! Your eyes, sir. Your face. It's bad. What are you talking about? Strike a light. Strike a light, I tell you. Strike a light. Strike a light. My name is Luke of Elephonesis. I am aide-de-camp to Captain Calipodius Serenites of the Roman legions now fighting in India. Yes, that Calipodius, Calipodius the Blind. It is almost impossible to believe what a year can do. It can make a boy into a man, a, a girl into a woman. For you see, before Calipodius became a great and revered captain who led his men bravely in battle, and then Calipodius the Blind, whom you undoubtedly know, he was simply a 17-year-old boy about to enter into an arranged marriage, an arranged marriage that the young woman involved most decidedly did not want to take place. It's not fair. I know, child, but life so seldom is. Why can't they understand? I don't want him. You hardly know him, child. All right, I'll say it. I don't want it. The moment I become his wife, my life ends. Heaven forfend. Don't speak in such a way, Anna. I want to be left alone. I want to find my own path. I am 17 years old. I've hardly lived. True enough. And I want books. Books and stories and science and philosophy for the rest of my life. I do not wish to become an ornament. Nobody expects you to like it, dear. Then why? Why must I be sold into a life of utter misery, utter boredom? Look around, Anna Melissini. What do you see? Books I haven't read. Books I will never read now. Oh, Sister Catherine, a life I will never lead. Listen to me, child. All of this, all of these books, the tapestries, your precious library, this convent and the school grounds along with it, all of this must be paid for. All of this costs money, a great deal of money. Money is a vulgar topic, Sister Catherine. I don't care a whit for it. 
spoken like a sheltered little rich layabout. Do not speak to your betters that way, nun. I'm sorry, Sister Catherine. Besides, I'm not that little. Think, child. Where does money come from? Where does true wealth reside? In the heart? In the alliance of families, Anna. The Melusini with the Serenites. You have an ancient lineage. The Serenites are one generation removed from the street. They have grown very rich, adapting the new machines and methods brought by the Aid Crystal. You, Melusini, are now as poor as church mice. Don't you think I know that, Sister Catherine? And no, you would be quite rich for church mice. Or commoners. But poor. Among the aristocracy of Constantinople, yes. You know we are facing bankruptcy. And thus so is this convent. Your family supports the cloister. They have bought the books in this library. I am not a fool, Sister Catherine. I understand this. Then you know that with the wealth... This alliance with the Serenites will bring to the Melusini family you can build a dozen such libraries. And hardly set foot in one of them. It isn't as bad as all that, child. I should at least marry for love. Then there is a man you desire to be with? No, certainly not. Perhaps you can learn to desire, if not to love. And I have heard that Master Calipodius is handsome enough. <gasps> Sister Catherine! No oh, one does hear rumors, even locked up in here. Oh, you surprise me. Well, oh, I may be a nun, but I'm also a woman. I wish I could stay locked up here with these books forever. The steam engine. The telegraph. The times are changing as they haven't for a thousand years. Not fast enough for me, Sister Catherine. Not fast enough. Dear Anna, I died that day, or thought I had. I was finally achieving the glory I left home to find. The Malwa made a great charge at the ramparts, but we repelled him. My men held firm. Oh, we rained a terrible fire upon those troops. Bullets, bombs, exploding shells. I was everywhere along the wall, giving orders like a professional. We won, Anna. But one mortar, one parting shot from their rear guard. Feeble, pointless. Our enemy was defeated. They were in retreat. The parting shot. And it took half my face. Anna. I'm blind. All right, I've got it all, sir. Want me to read it back to you? No, no. It's too long for the telegraph. Put it on the mail pack at home to Constantinople. Very good, sir. The Iron Triangle usually has reliable courier service to Constantinople, even though I hear the Malwa do their best to blow every ship that passes out of the water. Oh, well. We'll have to trust to the... The General, sir. Captain Serenites, welcome to the Iron Triangle. I know I shouldn't have come, General. But I felt so useless downriver. Maybe I can help with supplies. Or, or something. Calipodius, it is good to have you here. I may not be able to see, but I can still count, even if... Forget it's... that. I've got enough supply, clerks. Then there is nothing for me. Not at all. The truth is, lad, I'm delighted to see you. We're relying on telegraph here on the island for communication with the rest of the army. But the telegraph's a new thing for everyone. I know code. I could be a telegraph clerk. I could do it, sir. <laughs> Had in mind something a little more complicated. This command bunker is full of people shouting at cross purposes. I need a good officer who can take charge and organize this damn mess. You would have a blind man do this? Being blind won't be a handicap at all for this work. Probably be a blessing. General, I never expected to command again. I don't know what to say. Say yes, Captain Serenites. My tutors thought highly of my grammar and rhetoric. If nothing else, I'm sure I can improve the quality of the messages. <laughs> Calipodius, your reports are always clear, concise, and perfectly detailed. You do write them yourself, don't you? Of course, sir. I would never trust that task to anyone else. Then it's settled. It's real. I never thought... something real. I can do this.
And it was something my captain was good at. Within days, he understood the problem. Within a week, he had General Belisarius' communication center humming like a well-organized beehive. Yes, Calipodius found his place on the island known as the Iron Triangle. Being blind, he had come to realize, did not mean the end of life, although it did transform his dreams of fame and glory into much softer and more muted colors. Life is a crude thing, after all. It is a project begun in confusion, fumbling with unfamiliar tools, the end never really certain until it arrives. It is not unlike a blind man attending to his toilet. And to think a year before, another had believed her life at an end, as surely as had blind Calipodius. Who? Anna, Calipodius' new wife, of course. Take her to port! Take her to port, helmsman! Aye, my lord. Port! <sighs> That's more like it. A good ship to sail, the wind before us. We couldn't ask for better weather for a honeymoon voyage. Yes, it's lovely here. And this will be my one taste of the sea. No voyages for me. Should we put into Elephonesis and get a bite to eat? There's a tavern there that serves the best goat shish kebab you've ever tasted, and their wine is superb. Do what you want, Lord Serenites. Please. Call me by my Christian name, Anna. You're my wife now. Very well. Do what you want, Calipodius. Anna, what is wrong? You've been so cold. Are you worried that I don't find you attractive? Believe me, under all the clothes and makeup and veils you must wear lies a very beautiful woman. I found that out last night. I hope I did my duty. That and more, Anna. Did I not please you? You're an attractive boy. Sex was as I expected. That doesn't sound good. No, it was fine. You were fine. But now you're cold enough to frost my breath by talking to you. You don't understand. You will never understand. Anna, what have I done? You have crushed me like an insect. You don't even know you've done it. You're a man. How could you know? I... You're right. I don't understand. We'll do my duty for my family. Your duty? I see. There will never be affection, no friendship? I look at you and it enrages me, Calipodius. I suppose you know I could take a courtesan. Most men in my position would. But that's not for me. I have news. I was going to wait to share it with you until after we had gotten to know one another a bit. Well, no matter. This will no doubt please you in any case. I am going to war. I have applied for a commission in General Belisarius's army. I have been accepted onto his staff. I'll leave for India in a week. <laughs> you? You're going away to be a Roman legionnaire? How perfect. Not only will you shut me up in your house, you won't be here to escort me out. I am completely trapped. At least you won't have to look at me and be enraged. Not after this week. You understand nothing. I guess I do not. Helmsman, pick us into Elephonesis. I need a drink. Captain Serenides, Persian command at Daru Landing report Malwa incursion from the north-northeast. Looks to be regiment size, sir. Very well. Write it up, triplicate. One copy to General Belisarius, one for command staff, one for the files. First, CQ them for immediate reply. Yes, sir. They say there was hard fighting, but it's contained. Situation nominal. Make a note of that and include it with the file. Yes, sir. General Belisarius. You know me by the sound of my footsteps, Calipodius. Impressive. General, with my eyes gone, my other senses have improved tenfold. And my memory as well. It had to so that I could get around. But what's that I heard about Quagar landing? Regiment size, infantry attack, situation nominal. Hmm, maybe. Or maybe it's a feint by Link. That alien intelligence rarely makes a move without a reason. He cares nothing for the lives of his troops, but he won't have spent them to no purpose. Let's keep our ears to the ground up and down the line, Captain. Yes, sir. General. I have been thinking. A man does what he can. I am blind, but I am also educated and rich. These soldiers around us, they have helped me on my way far more than I have helped them. 
They have their own dreams and their own glory. I can't share that glory directly anymore. But if I could save it for the world... Out with it, lad. I do have a few pressing concerns at the moment. A record, sir. A history. A history of your campaign. Of the war. Of the coming of the Asante Shard aid, with all of its information about the future it shared with you. Of the coming of its malevolent counterpart, Link. A complete account. <laughs> That's a fine idea, Calipodius. Absolutely. I'm a fool not to have thought of it before. And you're the perfect writer. Thank you, sir. I shall, of course, work on the project on my own time. All of your time is mine so long as you're in the Roman legions, lad. And not only that, I have another task for you. Yes, sir? Dispatches to the Senate in Constantinople, mentioning deeds and naming names. As you say, the glory and sacrifice of these men should be noted. I'll have our young emperor read them aloud in the Senate forum, and then we'll publish them with our new printing presses. The families will want to hear, even if the news is sorrowful. I suppose I could... Yes, but I would write these dispatches differently than my history. No flourishes or literary allusions, just the plain facts, so the most uneducated can understand them. (laughs) I have it on good authority that a plain, unornamented style will be much more appreciated in the future than one of flourishes and high rhetoric. Good authority? As in that crystal you wear around your neck, with the infinitely intelligent mind inside? I'm afraid that aid says that your dispatches will be read long after your history is forgotten. They'll put you up there with Livy and Procopius. So get to it, lad. Yes, General. Immediately, sir. Is this the bunker of Calipodius the Blind? Who wants to know? We're from the 13th. We're Antioch men. The general sent us. Bring them in, Luke. Bring them in. All right, you heard the man. Who do we have here? A bunch of boys seeking fame and glory, lad. Speak up then, boys. Tell me everything. Name's Abelard. Abelard of Antioch. I'm the Hecatontark in charge of the westernmost bastion of the fortress of... You had hot fighting yesterday. I heard about it. Came at us like demons, sir, but we bloodied them good. I'll want to hear all the details. Luke here is my aide-de-camp, but he's also a scribe. Sit at the table. Over there, gentlemen, and we'll get started. I'll make sure it goes into the next dispatch. Thank you, sir, but begging Luke here's pardon, it's neither the fame nor the glory of it, it's just... Your dispatches get read to the Senate, sir, each and every one, by the Emperor himself, and then the Emperor, by express command, has them printed and posted all over the Empire. The printing press is a wonderful new thing. You see, we want it for our families, sir. They'll see our names and know we're all right, except for those who died in the fighting, but at least... Their names will exist somewhere. On something other than a tombstone. You have the truth of it there, sir. Let's get started. Get that baggage unloaded, you dogs, or I'll take the skin off your backs and leave you to rot in this godforsaken spot. You push us much harder, Captain, and you'll be the one rot. You and your cargo, too, if you want to call it Shut that. your foul trap. I figured this was a bad idea. A woman on a boat heading into a war zone. Don't matter how much silver she throws around, it ain't worth dying for. Now get moving, dogs. Captain, why are you unloading my baggage? We are not in Charax yet. Aye, lady, we're not. But this is as far as we're going. What do you mean? Do you plan to abandon me at this pier? There's not even a town nearby. I am, unless you have the silver to pay for a trip back down the river with me. I have no intention of going back with you, you terrible man. Oh, watch it, lady. There's those in these parts what won't take such insults as I do. But I hired you and your men to protect me. I paid you good money. You swore to Mother Mary. No amount of Roman silver is worth dying for, lady. Besides, I ain't exactly a Christian. Certainly are not. Leave my things and get out of here. I'll find another way to my husband. My very wealthy husband. I'll do that. Come on, boys. Drop that pile of woman's garbage and let's get underway. Word to the wise. Lady. Them river men over there under that neem tree look mighty friendly. If you know what I mean. And them three soldiers over by yonder well probably wouldn't mind being your friends, neither. You son of a bitch! (laughs) Good riddance, your ladyship. 
Haul away, boys. Let's get while the getting's good. Send us a note when you get there, your ladyship, so as we can know you arrive all safe and sound. Maybe you can get that blind writer fellow to put you in one of his dispatches, else we'll be worried stiff. <laughs> Go to hell. Oh, Mother Mary, what have I gotten myself into? What do we have here? Looks like a real Constantinople lady. How do they even breathe in what you are wearing? Looks like a walking tent to me. I would not mind crawling under that tent to see what is inside. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. No, no, princess. That's not going to happen. Always wanted to find out if it's true what they say. Come here. Let me go. Let me go, damn you. Yes, they say you Roman bitches shave your legs so fine and smooth. We'll soon find out when I take that. Yeah, gods of the fathers. Look at this, look at this, will you? What? What do you have there? Silver. Roman silver, enough to choke on. Put that down. Those are my only funds. I need them to keep going. I need them to find him. Oh, we'll have your silver. Please. And we'll have you over and over again. Oh, Mary. Angels! Shut up with that blasphemous cunt. <sighs> See this knife, Roman whore? You stay planted right here if you know what's good for you, or I'll cut your eyes out. No. No. I'll be back for you. Get your hands off those coins if you value your fingers. We'll split it eight ways among us all, right and proper. Damn right. You said it. Oh, God. Oh, God. What am I going to do? Oh, the soldiers. Maybe I can pay them to... Oh, God, I have to try. Please, you have to help me. We have to do no such thing. I'm begging you. Beg all you want, girl. There's eight of them and three of us. Look... I need help. <laughs> I'd say you do. You'll be lucky if they don't kill you after they rob and rape you. You speak Greek very well. Then you'll understand this. Stupid, noble woman. Brains like a chicken. Are you some kind of idiot traveling alone down this part of Mesopotamia? The difference between a river man here and a pirate... I'll pay you. She'll pay us! She says she'll pay us, brother! We can use their boat to take us out of Mesopotamia, beats walking, and the chance of another caravan. But what say you, Abdul? Yes, but nothing fancy. It's too hot. All right, here's the way it is. You give us half your money, and whatever other valuables you've got. Like this necklace here. Hands off. <laughs> I do admire you, girl. And I don't mean the way those rivermen like you. You've got spirit. I'll give you that. Like I said, half of everything, and we see you on your way home. I can't. I need the money Idiot, to... Idiot, you've got no business here, girl. Just be thankful you'll get out of this little adventure with your life. Not to mention keeping your precious hymen intact. That ought to be worth a lot once you get back to your family. My husband took care of that bastard before he went off to war and left me. God save us. An abandoned little wife, no less. Best come away from there, Roman slut. We have business with you. There's eight of us and three of them. Hey, we don't want any trouble. I'm sure we can work something out. Yeah, we can. We'll be there as soon as we get this properly split. And then you'd better hand her over. Think you're the first woman got abandoned by a husband looking to make his fortune in war? He already has a fortune. He went looking for fame. And he found it too, damn him. And what is the name of this paragon of martial virtue? Anthony, the illustrious courier. He is famous, at least in Constantinople, after Belisarius' letter was read to the Senate. And his own dispatches, too. Belisarius? What does the general got to do with your husband? What's this husband's name? Calipodius. Calipodius Serenites. Are you trying to tell us you are the wife of Calipodius the Blind? Yes, they tell me he is blind now. He was blind to me before. If you are lying... Why would I lie? As you say, why would you lie? And how do you expect me to prove it anyway? Can you read? I have his letters to me. Do you know him yourself? No less, we don't. We thought we were rich after Charax. We left the general service there. We... My name is Illus. This is my kid brother, Katomenes. 
We had enough money to buy us a big farm back home, and Abdul here decided to go in with I'm sick of the desert. Never did like camel. All right. Time to hand over the room in slot. Come to think of it, I'm sick of thieves and rapists, too. I'd tell you to stay back, girl, but I think you've at least got enough sense to do that. Come on, then, boys. For Belisarius. For Belisarius. For the general. What do you think you're doing, Isario? Stay back if you value your life. This is ours. And she's ours, too. You take the two on the left, brother. Abdul, you take the right. Not fair. That leaves you with four. Where did you ever get the notion that life is fair? Let's do this! I'll have done with you when I finish coming to you, you will. Ah! Your turn. Please don't! Please don't! Too late! Watch out, Illis! Well, Brother Illis, that was easier than I thought it would be. And who said you could have three, Abdul? <laughs> Where did you ever get the notion that life is fair? <laughs> You killed them. So fast. You killed them all. Get used to it, girl. You'll see plenty more of that where you're going. Especially if you make it to the island. The island? What island? You don't even know about that? The Iron Triangle, they call it. Where your husband is, along with the general. Right in the mouth of the Malwa Horde. I didn't know it was an island. I only knew it was somewhere in India. <laughs> God save us. Somewhere in India. <laughs> India is kind of a big place, your ladyship. It's where the general is making his stand, facing a hundred thousand Molwa. Ah, let's hope you learn something by the time we get to Charex. You're going to take me? You're going to take me? Well, to tell the truth, we've been having second thoughts about mustering out. It seems a shame to miss out on looting Malwa itself. Yes, we'll take you, girl. Hell yes. I assume you'll recommend us to the general. I'd really prefer a better assignment this time than being on the front lines. A bit dicey, that, when the general's running the show. He does insist on fighting. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine my husband needs a bodyguard. And he's certainly rich enough to pay for it. Done, wife of Calipodius the Blind. Done and done. This has been part one of Eric Flint's Islands based on the novella by Eric Flint, set in the world of the Belisarius series by Eric Flint and David Drake, starring Tracy Coppage as Anna and Paul Kilpatrick as Calipodius, featuring Lex Wilson as Illis, Jeff Aguiar as Belisarius, Izzy Berger as Sister Catherine, and Rika Daniel as Irina of Persia, with Carter, Paris Battle, Samuel Montgomery Blinn, Gray Reinhardt, PJ Mask, and Koki Daniel. Sound engineers, Barry Jacob and Craig Brandwine. Music by Maddie Karras and Sherry Leone. Adaptation and script by Tony Daniel. Directed by Jerome Davis. Bain Books publisher, Tony Weiskopf. This audio drama is copyright 2014 by Bain Books. Bain Audio Drama. From Bane Books, the heart of science fiction and fantasy. For more Bane audio drama and great Bane books, visit Bane.com. We hope you have enjoyed this production. And now here is part 25 of the complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Hard Magic. It's read by Bronson Pinchot. This portion of Hard Magic is provided by Audible.com. Get the complete audiobook at Audible.com now. If you're not a subscriber, you can get the entire audiobook free or choose from more than 100,000 other titles when you try Audible free for 30 days. Here's what has gone before. 
It's the 1930s in America, but it's an America that has been magically changed. In the 1860s, a handful of people from all walks of life were visited with special magical talents, and each generation more are so affected. These people are called actives. Most actives use their power for good, but some don't. Jake Sullivan is a private eye. He's also a former soldier, an ex-con, and an active heavy, the type of active that controls the force of gravity. Jake is good at this. Jake has been recruited by a mysterious secret organization of actives dedicated to seeing humanity through a possible magic-based apocalypse. They are known as the Grimnor Knights. If the Grimnor are to be believed, the evil forces of magic introduced into the world have reached a peak, and the apocalyptic finale of humanity may be about to begin. Here's part 25 of the complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Hard Magic. Tremonton, Utah Sullivan sat under the shade of a scraggly tree. The narrow box canyon was covered in the little trees, hardly more than sagebrush, and the grass was tall and yellow. The gentle hills were broken with occasional gashes of ancient stone. It was a beautiful spot in its own rugged way. He could see why the old Grim Noir had chosen this as his hiding spot. The box elder county sheriff's deputies were still combing through the wreckage of the cabin, but Sullivan pieced together what had happened after a few minutes of wandering around. Two cars full of men had come off the dirt road. Sven Christensen was no fool. He'd abandoned the structure, which was the obvious target, and headed up one of the hills. Despite Garrett saying that the old Dane was in his late sixties, he'd managed to lug a Browning 1919 and its tripod up there, and when the men in the cars had proven to be who he'd expected, he'd hosed them down. Christensen had picked his targets and fired short, controlled bursts, just like Sullivan had been taught as a machine gunner in the first. There were six bodies between the cars and the front of the cabin, all in various states of destruction. A large blood trail through the soft dust showed Sullivan where another man had been plugged bad but had somehow kept moving. One car was abandoned, hole through the radiator, puddle underneath. Tracks showed where the other had turned around and left. The walk had left Sullivan winded and his wounds aching, but he'd found the ambush spot. There were over a hundred shell casings, and since the browning ejected straight down, they tended to collect in a pile. Deep pockmarks in the rock showed where the goons had returned fire. It was the other set of tracks that appeared suddenly behind Christensen's position that showed what happened next. The cloven hooves were massive, but the spacing told Sullivan that they came from a bipedal creature. He put his own considerable weight down in the dirt and saw that in comparison the creature had been far heavier. Then the signs became confusing as the summoned had descended on Christensen. There was a claw mark scored into the rock where it had swung and missed. The three talons covered almost twice the space as Sullivan's big hand. The dried blood splatter told how it had ended. So now Sullivan sat under a tree, pondering what it all meant, while Heinrich and Garrett were having their turn being questioned. They had arrived twenty minutes after the law. Someone had seen the smoke rising from the valley and called it in. As strangers in the tiny community, they were automatic suspects. A few radio calls and a bit of investigation had confirmed that they'd arrived in Ogden too late to be the killers, but that didn't make them any less suspicious. Garrett was doing the talking, which was for the best, since with a little gentle magic, Garrett could probably talk his way out of near anything. Sullivan figured that Dan would have been smooth even if he didn't have magic. The man sure didn't look like much, but he'd probably make one hell of a door-to-door -door salesman. Sullivan had taken a liking to him, despite having to constantly check his head to make sure that it wasn't the mouth's magic talking. Heinrich was polite, but it was obvious that he personally didn't like Sullivan much. Jake was fine with that. He didn't really have any friends and wasn't looking to start collecting them either. The two Grim Noir joined him under the tree a bit later. Sheriff says we're free to go, Garrett said. I guess that old Sven had a reputation in the local Danish community, 
of having a lot of secrets in his past. They didn't seem too surprised to see him end up like this. What do you think happened? The one big-ass demon got him, Sullivan said. Probably 800 pounds, which means we're dealing with a summoner like I ain't seen since the war. You can read sign? Heinrich asked, surprised. You struck me as a city boy. I come from a place not much different than here. If we didn't kill it our own self, then we didn't get to eat. I moved to the city because that's where the work was. Garrett squatted down next to him and pulled out a smoke. Anything else? Another one of them got shot real bad, lost most of his blood, but his tracks say that he walked around under his own power for a long time. Looks like a big old boy, probably 300 pounds, and I bet he has to get his boots made special like me. Plus he was shooting this. Sullivan reached into his pocket and pulled out the moon clip. It consisted of six fired brass cases snapped into a sheet metal circle. He tossed it toward Heinrich, who caught it easily and held it up to read the head stamp. Fifty millimeter RL, these are huge. These come out of a cannon? Russian long, Sullivan said. Cossack cavalry had a limited run of them made for their war against the Japanese. Smith and Wesson filled the contract. Cossacks wanted something portable and short, but could still punch a Jap helmet at 300 yards. The shells were clipped together so they could load easier from the back of a moving bear. Damn thing even has a shotgun barrel for when they were up close in the trees. Most powerful handgun in the world, made specifically for brutes because it was loaded so hot it could sprain the wrist of a normal man. Don't see those around very often, Garrett said. So this big boy with the big gun got hit a bunch of times but kept moving. At first I thought he'd been killed from all the blood, then brought back as a damn filthy zombie. Heinrich scowled. You've got the real problem with zombies, don't you? I only want to have to kill somebody once. Killing them twice seems like work. But the tracks aren't from a zombie. They shuffle, stumble like their balance is all gone, and they don't take cover like this one did. So he got opened up, dumped most of his blood, and didn't worry about it. Either of you know what power that could be? There are other things besides natural powers, Heinrich suggested. We've not had a chance to tell you about those yet. The Imperium has special soldiers. The chairman picks them himself. They're called the Iron Guard, Garrett added. They're all strong actives to start with, but then he changes them. What do you mean, changes? There are two kinds of magic, Sullivan. Garrett explained. Natural occurring powers. One power, one person. Everybody knows how that works. He didn't correct him, though he personally knew Garrett was wrong. Sullivan figured he was good for at least one and a half himself. Then there are spells, where with different tricks you can capture some of the power and use it. The power can be chained to certain signs and words, Heinrich said. All Grim Noir learn a few, but we don't delve too deep. It's too dangerous. You screw up a chaining the power to a word, and bad things happen. Some of us are more talented than others. We stick with the easy ones, and we practice the hell out of them before we're allowed to do them on our own, Garrett said. The Imperium, though, they push the limits. They mark their servants, even ones that have no magic of their own, They'll mark multiple words permanently on their guards. It makes them into something else, something not human. The swordsman, he'd been different. Not only was his power something Sullivan had never seen before, it had been too strong. As they'd grappled, he'd felt the unnatural heat coming from under his shirt, like there had been something on fire against his skin. Rokusaburo? Normally, we don't try to take an iron guard unless we've got at least five to one odds, preferably more. We got lucky. Daniel grunted as he stood up. Come on, boys, we've got a long ride ahead of us. That was part 25 of the complete audiobook serialization of Hard Magic by Larry Correa, read by Bronson Pincher. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com. 
thanks to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And an enormous sky-spanning portrait of Admiral Ney Smith made of fireworks and shooting stars, along with a heaping helping of gratitude to Lois McMaster Bujold, author of Captain Vorpatrel's Alliance, Memory, and the creator of the Miles for Kosigan Saga. And roses and rockets to the cast and crew of Islands. Woohoo, it's finally debuted! Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy. And keep reaching for the stars. Bye.